I'm recording, so we have these. And for all my YouTube followers, right? I'm up, subscribers. I'm up to 12 YouTube subscribers on my math channel. Right? You know you can get paid for that? Yeah, it's not going to happen for me. Not 12. For views and likes, yeah. Mr. Hinton. Not for subscribers. All right, so inverse trig functions is kind of the next step. Uh, we're used to using inverse trig functions to solve for an angle and a triangle. So if we're looking for an angle and we know the sides, then we can use the inverse trig function to find the angle. Uh, if we're using the law of cosines, if y'all remember back to the law of cosines and the law of sines, if it's the angle that we're looking for, then we use the inverse trig functions to kind of unwrap it. And we're going to use inverse trig functions to undo trig functions. But there's some exceptions to the rule. All right? And we'll talk about that kind of toward the end of the lesson. Go ahead. Uh, she is just pulling into the parking lot, so I'm going to be bringing her down in a sec. All right. We're, we're, we're in our lesson, so just okay. tell her to come on in. All right. So here's some facts about inverse trig functions. And this ties into what you were just saying on the last test. Understanding what I'm looking at. Okay. On an identity, if we're talking about a trig function, the sine of x, y equals the sine of x or y equals the inverse <coughs> sine of x, what are the x and y? So, so it's important to know uh, in an, a trig function input angles, trig functions input angles and output numbers, inverse trig functions work in reverse. Okay? They input numbers and output angles. Okay? <coughs> trig functions, we put angles into it. If we're dealing with uh, y equals the sine of x, and we'll look at it in just a second. Okay. For, for example here, if we're looking at uh, y equals the sine of x. Oh, I need to go back. Y equals the sine of x. And we graphed this. We talked about what x can be. We talked about what y can be. In this particular uh, expression, x is an angle. So we could talk about y being the sine of 30 degrees, in which case it would be one-half. The sine of 30 degrees is one-half. And the output, the y, the range, is a number. Okay, so y equals the sine of x, what we put into the function, our input, x value, our angles, and our outputs are going to be numbers, right? Now what do we know about the numbers that come out of the sine function and the cosine function? What do we know about the numbers that come out of the sine function and the cosine function? <laughs> sine is the opposite side over the oh. <laughs> hypotenuse, right? That's too easy. But, no, well, it's not exactly the end result. I'm just oh. trying to help you prime the pump. What do we know about the opposite side of a right triangle over the hypotenuse of the right triangle? It's always less than or equal to 1, right? The sine value is less than or equal to 1. Come on in, Dr. Strell. You have a seat. <coughs> so um, what goes into trig functions is angles, and what comes out of the trig function is a number that's less than or equal to 1, greater than or equal to One over here, negative one over there. Right, so the output value is uh, between negative one and positive one. And if you'll recall when we tried to solve triangles back in test two, if you tried to take the inverse of a number bigger than one or less than negative one, what do you get? You get an error, and that's where it told us that we had no triangle when we were dealing with the ambiguous case. Okay, so inverse trig functions do the opposite of this. An inverse trig function is going to, uh, let's look at y equals, 
the inverse sine of x. Excuse the scribble there. If y equals the inverse sine of x, the input values, the x values here are numbers, and we are returning y values, our output values will be angles. <clears throat> So this is a really, really important and necessary skill that we're going to use uh, in this uh, unit on solving trig equations. Okay, now let's look at, uh, as a reminder, first of all, let's look at our table of special values. Our table of special values, what are our special angles? Zero, which we could also call zero radians, zero degrees. Thirty degrees is... Pi over 6. Next one, 45 degrees is pi over 4. The next one, 60 degrees is pi over 3. And then 90 degrees is pi over 2. All right, so those are our angles, and here we'll take the sine of theta, cosine of theta. Every denominator is what? Two. And every numerator has a square root. And we count up on the sine and down on the cosine. So sine of zero is zero. Sine of 30 is one half. Sine of 45 is square root of 2 over 2. <clears throat> square root of 3 over 2 for 60 degrees and square root of 4 over 2, which is just going to be 1. And then this is in reverse. 2, 3, 4. Okay, so those are going to be, this is just kind of, we need to be able to think quickly uh, for reference points what we're going to use for these values. Of course, you can simplify um, this one to be 0, this one is 1 half, and this one is 1, and the same with the bottom. All right, so that, ch that chart, that table, is going to be a quick reference for us as we work our way through this um, lesson. All right, so you've got it there handy. We'll also reference the unit circle as well. So let's dig in. If we're talking about the inverse sine of one-half. The inverse sine of one-half. So what are we putting in? We put a number into the inverse sine. What do we expect to come out of the inverse sine? An angle. Okay, what's the problem with that? I know this is a tough question. What's the problem with that? What do, you, what do you want to answer for this? What do you want to say? 30 degrees, or if we're in radians, we want pi over 6. Right, so we want to say that, but what's the problem with that? It's a tricky question because there's more than one answer. Right, if you just look at, we're looking at the sine, which is the y-coordinate unit circle. Uh, here's a one-half. Here's a one-half. Mm -hmm. And I can get to it positive direction. I could get to them in negative directions. I could go all the way around and come back to 30 degrees. I could go all the way around twice and come back to 30 degrees. All of those angles have a, um, a value, a sine value of pi over 3 or 1 half. <clears throat> so we could use pi over 6, but we could also use, what would that angle be? 4 pi over 6. 5 pi over 6, 5 pi over 6. If we went in a negative direction all the way back around, then we would have negative 11 pi over 6, and that one would be negative 7 pi over 6. So the reason that this is a tricky question is because there's more than one angle that fits the answer. So which answer is correct? If all of them are correct, then we can't deal with the inverse sine function as a function. By definition of a function, all the way back to algebra 1, a function can have how many output values for 
for an input value? Only one. So this is not a function if I put one half in and I get an infinite number of answers out. I can't have an infinite number of answers if I'm going to treat this as a function. And so mathematicians decided to restrict the output range of the inverse sine function. So the inverse sine function of, or the inverse sine of one half is just going to be values that are between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Your output for the inverse sine function has to be from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. What's the significance of those, you think? Negative pi over 2 is here. Positive pi over 2 is here. So we're going in the fourth quadrant and the first quadrant, right? Why couldn't we use the first quadrant and the second quadrant and go from 0 to pi? Because it has two answers there, right? The sign is positive here and the sign is positive here. And that's the problem we had when we were solving uh, the ambiguous case. Right? And you're dealing with obtuse angles and the law of sines. It doesn't work very well because the law inverse sine always gives you the first quadrant angle because it's between negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. So we, it wouldn't be good to skip this quadrant and go from 0 to pi over 2 to come all the way over here to get the negative sine angles. So it just made sense to restrict the range from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2 for any output function. So if the answer is not in the fourth quadrant or the first quadrant, and there's even some more restrictions on that, we're going to eliminate any angles that land in quadrant 2 because those are outside of this boundary. We're also going to eliminate any angles that pass through quadrant 2 or quadrant 3. So we can eliminate all values that pass through those. If we went all the way around to get to here, that's not good. We have to go down in a negative direction to pi over 2 or up in a positive direction to positive pi over 2. And we're going to keep only uh, the values that are between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. And that's where we're going to keep our answers. Okay. Now, the good news for this is on problems where calculators will be allowed, your calculator is going to get this right. If you do the inverse sine of 0.5, you're going to get 30 degrees or pi over 6. It's not going to give you four answers. It's only going to give you one. And that's why the domain is restricted so that it helps us get one answer instead of five or 50 million because we could keep going around until we get to these terminal sides of uh, pi over 6 reference angle. That's the domain. No, that's the range. That's the output. So remember, um, in the inverse sine function, if y is the inverse sine of x, <clears throat> the input values are the x values. These are numbers, okay, numbers between negative 1 and positive 1. The output values are angles. So that's an important concept to remember when you're using the identities. You asked the question about the last test. The identities, you're dealing with angles with the identities. You're not dealing with numbers. The numbers are outputs. The angles are inputs. For inverse trig functions, it's opposite. Okay? So pi over 6 is the answer we're looking for there. <clears throat> Next example. <coughs> the inverse sine of negative square root of 2 over 2. What's different about this? It has a negative value, right? What's the reference angle from our table of values? What's our reference angle for square root of 2 over 2? 45 degrees or... Pi over 4. Let's be radians today. We'll kind of reference that. But pi over 4 is the reference angle. So I've got two possible answers for this one, right? What are my two possible answers in the output range of the inverse sine? Pi over 4 or 7 pi over 4 is not in my output range, right? So let's, let's go back to that. My answer here has to be between... <coughs> 
Negative pi over 2. And positive pi over 2. Now, y'all are telling me 7 pi over 4. And 7 pi over 4 does indeed have a sine value of negative square root of 2 over 2. But is 7 pi over 4 in this range of values? Okay, and this is the tricky part of it. We have to pick an angle that is in that range of values. It has to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2, which forces us to choose what angle here? Negative pi over 4. I have to get to 7 pi over 4, which is indeed correct, but I get to it by going down. So that's negative pi over 4. Remember, the answer can't pass through the second or third quadrant to get there. It has to be between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So that's going to be negative pi over 4. All right? Pi over 4 reference angle in the fourth quadrant. All right, next example. This is a different way of putting it. You'll see some of these in your assignment. Another way the inverse sine function can be written as the arc sine. I prefer this notation. I'm going to show you why I prefer this notation in a moment, but it's kind of become standardized. All your calculators say in sine inverse, sine of negative one. Um, this can be read as, this notation can be read as the arc whose sine is negative one. The arc or angle that has a sine value of negative one. I like it just because it reads a little better. And the reason that I like it better, this is, I'm gonna chase a rabbit here for a second, is because uh, sine to the negative 1 or sine inverse of x is a bit confusing, right? What does sine squared of x mean? It means what? Sine x times sine x, right? And sine to the negative 2 of x means 1 over sine squared x. So those laws of exponents work really, really nicely. But sine inverse of x is not equal to 1 over sine x. So do you see the confusion? The inverse symbol is not an exponent. It's an inverse. Um, we have to write inverse sine of x completely different. We'd have to write the inverse sine of x as, excuse me, we'd have to write the uh, reciprocal of the sine x as the sine of x raised to the negative one power, like that, which is not how we do regular exponents with the sine function. So I prefer this, and a lot of old textbooks use arc sine x instead of uh, sine to the negative one exclusively. Yes? Okay, in the, in the coordinate plane, remember positive angles, this goes back to like test one material, so this could be something that would go, uh, positive angles travel in that direction. So that's uh, all the way up to pi over 2, 90 degrees, that's 0 to 90 degrees. But to get the negative values for sine, I would have to go to the third quadrant or to the fourth quadrant to get negative values. And it just doesn't make sense to have a function that travels here, takes two quadrants off, because you know we're not going to use any of those values, and then use the positive side of this. Okay, so we need first quadrant angles and fourth quadrant angles, but the most efficient way to get to first quadrant angles and fourth quadrant angles is to use the positive ones and the negative ones. So when you travel in a negative direction, you go down to negative pi over 2. Good? Now, cosine is going to work a little better, and we're going to do cosine next, because cosine is positive here and negative here. Cosine is positive and negative. So we can just 
first quadrant, second quadrant, and be done with cosine. But we knew the law of cosines works great for negative angles already, or for negative values. Okay? All right, so back to this. The arc sign, that's another way of doing the inverse sign. They're asking us what arc or what angle has a sine value of negative 1. What's the answer to that question? Negative pi over 2 has a sine value of negative 1. And that's in the range, right? Negative pi over 2 has a sine value of negative 1. Cosine, sine. Negative pi over 2. This says 3 pi over 2, but we're going to go backwards to get there, which gives us negative pi over 2 for, for that answer. This is pretty easy once you get used to I'll show you the tricks and exceptions. Now, the inverse cosine of the square root of 3 over 2. Inverse cosine, we're switching functions. Same thing. This is going to output an angle. <clears throat> the cosine is positive where? First quadrant and fourth quadrant. It's positive in the first and fourth. Uh, it's negative in the second and third quadrant. So I can go from zero to pi and go all the way through my cosine values. I can go from one all the way to negative one. And all of the cosine values are in the first quadrant. So to keep the inverse cosine function a function that only puts one value out, uh, we're going to limit the cosine. The range for the inverse cosine goes from 0 to pi. So every answer that comes out of the inverse cosine function has to be in that range from 0 to pi. <clears throat> this is a little more natural than the sine function. We don't have to include any negative angles. And this is why we didn't really fuss over using the smallest angle when we were solving triangles using the law of cosines. We still did it as a force of habit, but the inverse cosine works great with uh, obtuse angles. The inverse cosine, excuse me, the, yeah, the inverse cosine works great with obtuse angles. The inverse sine does not work great with obtuse angles. It's going to return that fourth quadrant angle, which is not useful for us. There's no negative angles in triangles themselves. So what's the answer going to be here? What is the inverse cosine of the square root of 3 over 2? Pi over 6 or 30 degrees is correct. We need the first quadrant or the second quadrant angle. It's positive in the first quadrant, so we're going to take pi over 6 and move on. Being able to answer these questions quickly is going to help us solve the trig equations in the next uh, next few days, actually for the next week. Wait, so what's the answer? The answer is... Pi over 6. So, the, what do you have to know the range for? Cause, wait, just because there's multiple things? That's a great question because there's multiple angles that have that. So right? It, if I went all the way around, Emma, mm -hmm. to uh, 13 pi over 6, 13 pi over 6 also has a cosine value of square root of 3 over 2. So we restrict the range so we only get one output value. Okay, and that's why the chart is so important? The chart is very important to be able to recognize what the angle is. Then we place it in the correct quadrant. Sydney? So for sine, you just look at the quadrants 1 and 4, and for cosine, 1 and 2. I mean, like that's correct. And, in, and for sine, it's 1 and 4, but to get to 4, remember, you have to use, go in the negative direction rather than all the way around to four. You can't pass through quadrants two and three. Yeah, you've got it. And as we practice this, you'll, you'll get better. So arc cosine of negative one-half, same as the inverse cosine of negative one-half. We're looking for the angle or arc that has a cosine value of negative one-half. Now, the one-half tells us our reference angle is what? Pi over, three. Pi over three, but we have to put it into the second quadrant because the cosine is negative. The cosine of this angle is negative, which means it is a second quadrant angle. And if we put pi over 3 in the second quadrant, what do we get? 2 pi over 3. Very good. 120 degrees. Okay. 2 pi over 3.
All right, before we move to tangent, let's add the tangent to our table of values. Tangent as an identity is what? Mm, yes, but not what I'm looking for. It's sine divided by cosine, right? So tangent is um, this value divided by that value. That's zero, not six. One over the square root of three, which you could rationalize if you wanted to. Um, pi over four, square root of two over square root of two is one. Square root of three over one is square root of three. And one divided by zero is undefined. So when we're dealing with the inverse tangent function, we're going to see one of these five values. Because what goes into the inverse tangent? The numbers and the angles come out. When we're dealing with sine, one of these five values. We're dealing with cosine, one of these five values. So there's, there's so much repetition here that you're going to get used to doing it. Now we'll solve some um, trig equations that are outside of these, but it's just a little unorthodox. Special angles is just for, from a practical standpoint. Um, as a carpenter, I build houses and trim. You always see these angles. These are the ones you see in, in the real world. Really, mostly just 45s and 90s. You don't see very many 30s or 60s, but, but they're there. So we're dealing with the inverse tangent. We still want it to spit out just one set of values, right? The inverse tangent, let's recall what the graph of the tangent function looks like. It has asymptotes, pi, a hot mess. It has asymptotes at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. And it looks like this. And then it's broken. It repeats itself, right? So does it make sense to um, take an, uh, an interval of this that went from 0 to, say, pi? Because it, it includes this broken value you know, right, right in the middle of it. Now, we still have broken values. We can talk about what the uh, inverse sine of undefined means. But, uh, so the, the range, the output value for the inverse tangent is going to go from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 just like the sign does, so that it spits out only one value. It takes every value between those two things, so our tangent uh, range is going to be the same as the sine function from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. And we are out of time. Huh. All right, start a class tomorrow. We will finish this lesson, and uh, I'll give you your assignment. We'll have some time in class tomorrow to work on the assignment as well. Welcome back. Y'all have a great day.